Hi and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures again. In this lecture we will be discussing about the equilibrium and uh, the center of gravity and uh, various type of stresses, strains and uh, things as such as that. So what is equilibrium? So when an object is said to be equilibrium? So, well, here this box is said to be at equilibrium if I place it on top here you know, on top of here um, and, and I hold it if the this box is said to be at equilibrium if there is no momentum there is no rate of change of momentum or the net momentum on this body is zero and the net angular momentum on this body is zero so if both the angular momentum and the linear momentum on the body is zero then the body is said to be at linear, I mean at equilibrium, okay? So there is one. So we are generally interested and focused about uh, static equilibrium here, I mean, <laughs> to say bodies that are at rest. So, so consider a, uh, this is a wall and uh, or a shelf where you have books one after the other. So all these books are resting, uh, you know, against this wall here. So wall, and uh, these are the books. So these books, uh, I mean, these books are said to be in static equilibrium because their linear momentum as well as the angular momentum are zero. I mean the net angular momentum is zero. Okay, so so the requ requirements for a equilibrium is one one the force the net force is zero. Second, the net torque is zero. That's the reason. Since the body is at rest, it is called as the static equilibrium. It is equilibrium. It is an equilibrium and it is at rest. Hence, it is called as the static equilibrium. Okay. So the next for conditions for static equilibrium is that the total force on the books here is zero and the torque on the books is zero. That means the body cannot rotate. The body cannot move or accelerate. So the torque, when you measure the net torque, it has to be measured in such a way that the measured torque about any point on the body is zero. So, if the I mean, if the measured torque is uh, well not zero at some point on the body, then the body is not said to be in equilibrium. Okay. So this is what is about the equilibrium. Now, for the same example, we shall go back to the Newtonian mechanics for hopefully the one last time. Uh, no, we won't because again we have gravity. So I represent the books by a small point, point mass, like we do in the Newton's law and you write this as mg and this is n and so on. So the books here is represented by a dot. Right? Right. So here, what are you representing actually? Oh, you are representing the book with a point and the point here you are showing that the gravitational force acts at that particular point. So the point at which the gravitational force acts on the body is called as the center of gravity of the body. Okay. So uh, if the, you know, the, the size of the body is say like a book which is smaller uh, so then the center of mass and the center of body, I mean gravity of the body coincides. So there is no need to find uh, both differently. But however, if it's a car or a big truck, then the center of mass and the center of gravity will be different. Okay. So it's just an introduction class to these, uh, these, these, uh, you know, center of gravity is uh, because center of mass has already been discussed and you know how to calculate the center of mass. So the center of gravity and the center of mass coincides with the body. So just in case 
if you are asked to calculate the center of mass of a toothbrush, don't worry. Don't worry. It's the center of mass of the tooth toothbrush itself is the center of gravity of the toothbrush. So these kind of things are uh, pretty challenging, you know, to read. But of course, it's very simple if you just can think. As I said, uh, if the body is you know small enough, uh, not as big as a truck or a home or a or a uh, you know a, a big estate car or a, um, you know. At least say for the motorbikes, motorbikes is also, you know, the center of mass is and center of gravity is different. So something very small um, as such as the pen, a chair, the center of mass and the center of gravity coincides. So if you find out the center of mass, then the center of gravity itself uh, uh, is the center of mass. Anyway, so now next, the elastic forces. So now we shall consider uh, a molecule of a solid. So here this so uh, just uh, imagine that this is a, a germanium atom that I'm writing here. Okay. All right. So here, uh, every atom is, uh, these are every, say, atom in a molecule, or a molecule, you know, doesn't matter. Atom. And this is germanium. So uh, here, every molecule, or sorry, atom is uh, attracted by each other. And uh, of course, they are in place. It's a three-dimensional lattice that I'm that I've drawn here uh, on a two-dimensional board, and hence the diagram is wrong. But uh, well, uh, this is how you uh, represent it on a two-dimensional board. So, uh, however, this is a three-dimensional lattice that I've drawn. So, what happens here exactly? What? Wh how is it related to elasticity or elastic? property is, say if I drop something on this or if I apply pressure on this, the, it deforms and comes back to its original place or original position. So it means that the body, when I apply some force, that is that I am stressing the body, the body comes back to its initial place. That's why I have drawn springs in between those atoms. It, it is because the springs actually, I mean, the atoms actually behave like as if they are attached with, with the spring. They come back just like the spring force. If you just, uh, you know, um, well, extend the string or the spring, sorry, uh, ex extend the spring uh, in one direction, it, the restoring force acts in the opposite. Hence, the same way the things happen even here. So, the elastic force. Is, is always the elasticity is a property that is uh, present due to this beautiful uh, you know property uh, sorry beautiful uh, way of the atoms binding together uh, in the uh, germanium or you know, similar lattices in metal most of the metals so some peculiar the peculiar thing about germanium atom is uh, when you cool it to when you cool it closer to zero Kelvin uh, the motion, of the jiggling motion uh, of these atoms are minimum. It's not zero, it's minimum. So uh, when the jiggling motion is zero and the perpetual motions are almost close to uh, zero and they are localized, then what exactly happens if there is another particle like a neutrino that comes in and passes in between, the atom starts to vibrate. Okay? And uh, then uh, this is the way you detect cosmic ray particles and that this is the way you detect neutrons. This is the way you detect weakly interacting massive particles or mass, uh, you know, macros or WIMS that we call. So, I mean, we'll, we'll discuss about this in the, you know, later and the later and the later uh, section in the quantum physics. However, you know, the neutrinos are, if they pass through this, that, you know, a scientist has, uh, you know, 
um, made himself home in the mine, like about I don't know six kilometers below the surface of the earth, in in the mine. So in mine, uh, of course they cool it close to zero Kelvin, and you have germanium atom. So as soon as a neutrino or a wimp passes through it, it starts vibrating. Then, uh, you know, depending upon the position and uh, the vibration, they just uh, decide whether it, you know, the particle is a neutrino or a produced neutrino, what type of neutrino. Most of the times, they come across the electron neutrino, right? Okay. Next is this: the three elastic moduli are used to describe the elastic properties of objects uh, as they respond to the force are you know the stress strain so the stress as I said is uh, the stress is uh, the fractional change in the length and the strain is the force per unit area so stress is equal to modulus times strain. You can write it as, um, well, we should write about this later, further. Uh, you know, in particular, for a case with a tension and compression, F by A is equal to Young's modulus, sorry, yes, Young's modulus E times uh, delta L by L. That is what is strain, and this is what is stress, and this is the Young's modulus. Uh, so, so this is what uh, is the three types. Uh, one more type is shearing. So shearing is when the object is under shearing stress, and like. It's almost about to break. So shearing is also a type of stress. Too much stress. Shearing is given by. Do we have the formula? Yes, we do. So if it is shearing, if by a g times our delta x by l, delta l by l. So here, this is the shearing modulus is the constant. Okay, so we are done with the shearing and the elasticity. Elasticity is a very good property. Rubbers have this elastic property and silicon is the vulcanization is a process used to increase the elastic properties of rubber tires and so on. You know, to Cope up with the stress of everyday roads. Now, hydraulic stress. When an object undergoes hydraulic compression due to the stress exerted by other fluids, it is called as a hydraulic stress and it is given by formula P is equal to B delta V by V. Since it's a volume, uh, this is the way you write delta V by V, and uh, here uh, it is the bulk modulus. V is the bulk modulus. Hydraulic stress P is what it is. So, the good news is that we are at the end of this beautiful uh, one dimension, two dimension, three dimension motion. Of course, the gravity is still there. And we'll have to go back to Newton's laws and stuff again to define them. Uh, and uh, well, uh, the next lecture includes that. But I'm very happy that, uh, and I'm free. I'm I'm proud that uh, you know I was able to make it through some of those chapters. Uh, you know that in that that is pretty complex when it comes to the motion. So the motion chapter is over. Both the linear motion and the rotational motion. Till now is over. Okay, we are not studying the rotational motion and the linear motion ever again. I mean, I'm not. I'm going to mention it. I'm not going to, of course, get deeper into it. 
So um, we shall apply those things from now on rather than study. So uh, we have completed our linear motion, the translation motion, and the linear motion is being completed. So uh, I look forward to doing the, the gravitational force and then going to sound and uh, then the electromagnetic waves and electrostatics uh, and then uh, end with uh, the cosmic ray particles and you know the particle physics and, th and special theory of relativity of course I want to do the mathematic aspects of it rather than just the theoretical aspects of it so, um, so thank you for watching again it's goodbye for now